Hello, everyone. My name is Katerina Kiria, and I'm your sustainable development host here at World Made Good. And today we're joined by Daniel Rund, Senior Vice President and Director at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and the renowned global thought leader. Dan, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Katerina. I'm thrilled to be on your show. You recently published your new book, The American Imperative, Reclaiming Global Leadership Through Soft Power. This book is the first in decades to look at America's non-military power through the lens of great power competition, and it urges the U.S. to fix the current system of soft power. In this book, you argue that global leadership is going to be asserted not on the battlefield, not in Beijing or Moscow, but rather through economic and other soft power tools applied in developing countries. And if not done by the US, then these vacuums will be filled in by China and Russia. So my question is, how can the US leverage sustainable development as a soft power tool to position itself ahead of China and Russia? Thanks, Katerina. I think I wrote this book because I think we're in an age of great power competition. And I think that China and Russia together can fill vacuums that the West, the United States, Europe, Japan, and our allies leave behind. I also think that the developing world has changed. It's not our grandparents' developing world. It's richer, freer, and more capable. So the kinds of partnerships and the kind of engagement that our partners and friends in developing countries want has changed and evolved. So I think we need to go back to the drawing board and rethink what we're offering to our friends and partners and also making sure that we're speaking to the hopes and aspirations of of countries all over the world. To the extent that we don't, China and Russia will fill voids that we leave behind. So in the case of environmental issues and sustainable development, the United States and the West have been leads on ensuring clean air and clean water, more livable cities, Uh, environmental management, leveraging civil society to speak up for environmental causes and helping to support the creation of civil society and all over the world to speak to those things as part of the architecture of democracy. And so I think we've also been, the West in partnership with many countries has also brought new technologies to create cleaner water and cleaner air. Um, So I think it's very appropriate that the United States and allies like in Europe or Japan and other places continue to support the kind of work we've been doing for 30 or 40 years. At the same time, I think that um, as we deal with environmental challenges, we're going to have to think about um, how we're going to work with developing countries. So, for example, if we're going to have a carbon transition, we're going to need to do a lot more mining. We're going to need to have a lot more mining that's environmentally friendly, community friendly, and respects labor rights. And also is fair to community, local communities and respects the rights of indigenous people. But we're going to have to have a heck of a lot more mining. We're going to have to have a lot more copper mining, and we're going to have to have a lot more mining of rare earths. And then we're going to have to have to process all of those metals. We're going to have to have three, four, five times the amount of mining activity given the current technology constraints so that we can have all the electric batteries that we're gonna need for electric vehicles. Otherwise, what we're gonna have is we're gonna switch a dependency on Iran and Saudi Arabia and Venezuela for a dependency on China, which has about 40% of all the metals processing in the world. So I think we have to have a strategy on mining and minerals as part of our strategy for sustainable development. And I think it's not, we haven't fully thought that through yet. I also think We need to think differently about urbanization in cities. There's going to be a lot more urbanization. And so part of it is making sure that cities are livable in terms of clean air, clean water, access to drinkable water, making sure that cities are livable places. So we have a number of environmental responsibilities of things like conservation of forests, management of oceans. So there's any number of different challenges that that relate to the sustainable development agenda that are important for the United States and the world to take on and that we should be doing, but we can't do alone. The United States can't do alone. The other Western countries can't do alone, but also we need the private sector. We need science. We need civil society. And then we need to work with partners in the developing world to make all this work. 
Then you have also held positions at the World Bank and USAID, where you built Prosper Africa, a U.S. government initiative to deepen America's commercial and development engagement in Africa. And this has largely been part of your agenda for the past few decades. So based on your experience, what can the U.S. truly offer to these newly empowered developing world and to failed states? And to what extent is this an alternative to what China can offer? So I think in the context of Africa, I would also say that it's not your parents' Africa or your grandparents' Africa. 30 years, from, since in the last 30 years, there's been many social and impro educational improvements, health improvements, uh, improvements in terms of democratic governance in Africa. There have been the emergence of, of a middle class of several hundred million people. By 2030, about 50% of all people living in Africa will live in cities. There's been an emergence of very high quality, higher educational institutions in Africa. There have been two or three cohorts of very able elite leaders in Africa, business leaders, government leaders, social sector leaders, some educated in the West, some educated in Africa, who are building a new Africa. And either the United States and the West are going to be good partners in that because there's win-win opportunities for us and we need to do so in a, in a partnership way. Or um, they're going to partner with China, who sees Africa as a business opportunity. Not, and, and so I think we would do well in the West to understand that Africa is an enormous opportunity. It's a billion people today. And in 20 years, it'll be 2 billion people. There'll be more people living on the continent of Africa and 54 sub-Saharan African countries than all of the citizens of China and all of the citizens of India in 20 or 25 years. It's going to be an enormously consequential part of the world. So we've been a pretty, the United States has been a pretty good partner to Africa. We haven't been a perfect partner to Africa. We could be a better partner. And so we need to do a number of things. For example, we need to renew um, the African Growth and Opportunity Act. We probably could improve upon it. And I think we should use that as an opportunity to think about what kind of partnership we want to have with Africa going forward. And Africa would like a, a great and deep economic and commercial partnership with the United States. Africa would like a deep uh, and commercial partnership with other parts of the world as well. Africa is open for business and is, should be seen as an enormous opportunity. And I don't think many enough stakeholders and private sector stakeholders in the West, including in the United States, fully understand what an amazing opportunity Africa is as a business opportunity. In order to prevent conflict, uh, we need to invest in development and good governance, which is something that you explore further in your book. Well, you mentioned in one of your recent interviews, and I quote, our foreign aid is a supporting actor in someone else's movie. It's not the main character. And I, and I thought that this was particularly interesting. Well, last year alone, America spent $44 billion on foreign assistance and 768 billion on military spending. So how do we balance these numbers? How do we shift the focus from um, militarization and defense to international development and good governance? So I think that um, the governance agenda, whether it's the, more democracy, support for human rights and the issue of good governance, both kind of economic governance and sort of political governance and sort of public management as a function are really important parts of what foreign aid can do or can support. So in, in 1980, there were about 40 or so countries that were democracies. And by 2017, about 90 countries were democracies. So there's been some slippage, they're not perfect, but the world is a more democratic and free place if we take 1980 as a starting point till today. It's, it's definitely a freer place. Now, I think also any of the major changes in terms of confronting issues like, like corruption, which is often a vote moving issue and something, there was a study done by the World Economic Forum about 10 years ago, and something like 100 countries out of 200 countries, the issue of corruption was a vote moving issue. And so, most progress, there has been significant progress in the world on confronting corruption. 
all over the world. And it's not something that's solvable. Rather, it's something to manage. It's something that we have to manage, sort of like blood sugar or, or something like that. It's not something that we're ever going to solve for. We have to manage it. And so we, I think the world is there trans, some, some improvements in transparency through technologies, some of it about a more active global civil society. Uh, to the extent you have active media and informed and educated and trained media, that's important. So improvements through the internet have also made things more clear. And so I also think, uh, so I think institutions like the OECD, uh, other, other, other initiatives led by different countries have been really important in this issue. So as a result, but uh, there's been more improvements on issues such as governance. There's also been, I think, some significant improvements on human rights. Uh, there's lots of places in the world where that's not the case. But net net, there's been a lot more understanding that, you know, treating as everybody in your society as, as fair as possible and giving everyone a chance to free, fair shake and be treated accordingly is something that's largely is, is impre- increasingly recognized as a global phenomenon. So we're not perfect. But I would argue that most of those improvements have required a coalition of the willing. I would also argue that most of the improvements in, in democratic go- democracy, good governance and human rights have required some leadership by the United States. Now, the United States is not perfect. We're not a perfect democracy. We have problems in human rights and making sure that, that everyone's treated in our country uh, fairly. And you know we have problems of governance, problems in this country. But someone had to stand up, no matter how imperfect, and lead on this. And so any of the progress in the last 40 years on these issues have come about because of American leadership. Daniel, you also uh, talk a lot about the importance of sharing the burden and building partnerships. So what would be the role of multinationals in promoting and leveraging the SDGs? Great. Thanks so much, Katerina. So global companies bring global standards on labor, on environmental on environmental issues, on bringing technologies and business processes to all over the world. Um, they also, what has been very impressive and surprising to me has been the global acceptance of the sustainable development goals by global multinationals. I would argue that the SDGs, the biggest audience for the sustainable development goals has been global multinationals. In some ways, the sustainable development goals are a form of Esperanto, So sort of that 19th century international language that people looked for, that we all can talk to each other. So businesses and civil society and governments and multilateral uh, organizations can all come together and talk to each other about the same challenges, measure them in the same ways, and talk about their differentiated contributions to solving these challenges and meeting these problems. So the sustainable development goals, I think, and, and the contributions of companies to responding to the sustainable development goals has been something that's particularly interesting and impressive. At the same time, I think global multinationals have a responsibility to seek and ask for the highest and best playing field on corruption as possible. Companies have a role around the world in seeking for high standards and, and at demand governments and civil society and local companies to adhere to best global best practices on things around bribery. And the other thing is that what we need is to have capable government sectors that can make sophisticated decisions about public sector procurement. This is something that seems a little bit dense and a little bit obscure, But governments often control in developing countries 30% or 40% of the GMP per capita of in a country through their procurement power. So how governments buy and buy services and make decisions about those products and services is really important, including infrastructure. So the private sector has a role to play in helping work with governments to make sure that we have really capable and uh, effective Uh, decision makers in government to make the best decision best made on best value for public sector procurement. Daniel, thank you so much for your answers. Um, as always, it's uh, it's always a pleasure to hear and to learn from you. And um, uh, we wish you all the success with this new book. I'm sure you will reach the right audience. And in World Made Good, we look forward to meeting you again. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks so much, Katerina.